uh, I'm a director at Atelier Academy, and uh, I've been working for seven years at Atelier. And some of the kind of work that I do includes transformative learning journeys, working with different organizations on their strategic design, participatory processes, uh, working with systems and organization and culture change. And today I'm connecting to this event from, from London, from IDEO offices, from our uh, Kuyu sister company. And it's also kind of a important moment for me. Uh, I'm not a designer by uh, training. I kind of started practicing uh, teaching design, design thinking some 10 years ago. And I kind of, uh, in the beginning of my career, I taught myself through different kind of IDEO case studies, IDEO resources. And I'm kind of, uh, yeah, right now is uh, kind of excited to be here in this office. Uh, speaking to you and also kind of speaking about what is next for design, what is next for uh, design thinking. And uh, today I will be talking about uh, this relational design is a, is a kind of emerging approach to design that we've been uh, exploring at, uh, at Atelier. And also uh, this is the first time uh, we will be talking to an audience about relational design. Also, uh, we want to extend this invitation to you uh, to join, the, uh, join this conversation, this emerging conversation on uh, relational design. And where does this kind of conversation comes from? First of all, it comes from Atelier's journey, the, our impactful uh, way of working uh, with different organizations. It also comes from this uh, relational approaches, this relational term in management and systems change. Also kind of a recent conversation on around uh, some criticism and reflection on uh, design thinking. And when we say Atelier's way of working, I think we, uh, we, we seen it through Lean's presentation with kind of Benge's intro as well. Uh, we are we are building a strategic design studio, a creative hub, a kind of a creative community together to uh, build relationships, exchange ideas, and collaborate on impacted, impact oriented uh, projects. And the way we do these projects, uh, I would say, is quite unique. That uh, with these kind of uh, organ organizations that we are partnering, all the kind of creative talent, the collaborators that we are partnering in project, we. We almost form like a, we work like a one single team. We, we form like a almost a temporary organizational unit that tackles uh, complex uh, challenges together. And when we look at Arturia's impact, uh, so it's been 10 years, uh, right? So we, we work with more than, uh, we did hundreds of projects. We did more than 100 projects. We work with tens of different organizations and we work on a variety of new products, services, new spaces, new platforms, new initiatives. Uh, but when we went back to our partners and asked for kind of testimonials about what has been kind of impactful for them with working with Atelier, there are there are some patterns that we are seeing. There are some key things that we keep uh, hearing in terms of when it comes to our impact. One is that these these individuals, these leaders where we work, that they are even further empowered as creative leaders to confidently navigate and lead change in their organizations, in their situations, or the teams that they are part of or teams that we worked. Uh, there's an enhanced collaboration by embra embracing diversity and also uh, building on, on the sense of uh, shared trust in the teams. And also organizations are generally enriched by gaining fresh perspectives, new frames, new meanings, uh, new views on, their, on the complex challenges, on the complex issues that they are uh, working on. And this comes from this, this power of relationships, right? The power of relationships. The, the quality of relationships that Atoli is building with his partners, with the, with the collaborators, with the creative community that we are surrounded by. But it's also power of relationships uh, that's kind of, that, that also immerse in the society as parallel to the Atoli story. And it's very, uh, very much aligned to the, what kind of Emily was saying uh, right before uh, my, my speech is that it's, it started with the pandemic, right? Pandemic has brought this sense of shared vulnerability and interdependence. And it's really, kind of make it obvious that our innate, innate needs for belonging and, and care. And also pandemic has demonstrated that, that uh, our mechanistic institutions that we designed and engineered in the past 200 years are not really uh, equipped to uh, respond to the current complex challenges that we have. And then we are not simply not in control when it comes to uh, controlling the outcomes when we deal with uh, complexity and uh, uncertainty. And now, uh, well, as we adjust to this norm, new normal, there's a rising conversation that adapting relational approaches to invest in the quality of relationships is, is one of the most effective leverage points to uh, steer the systems that we are part of toward the more transformative outcomes of 
fairness, vitality, regeneration, and uh, and sustainability. And uh, this is this conversation present in 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 kind of recent literature in management, in social innovation, and in systems change. And there is a kind of a key uh, provocation that this this kind of this conversation uh, breaks. You know, when we think about impact. Uh, can we also think about relational impact? You know, impactful work is the sense of this impactful work is enabling healthy relationships that will enable many other healthy relationships. Can be can we can we just see it as a is a long term impact that we work in the when we work with the uh, systems? And there is also a few uh, I would say sub kind of assumptions that uh, that supports this uh, provocation. Uh, one of them is that uh, relationships are inherently valuable. They are not just means to an end. They are. They might be the end in itself. Can we consider this as a as a as an assumption when we engage with our work, when we engage with and we 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 change with innovation with design? Uh, now there is growing evidence that says when we design and build things, products, solutions, services, and systems in relations well, they they simply work uh, better. And also. Now we see a, a kind of this strategic response to inten intentionally investing in relational in infrastructure, right? Like the, the non tangible ways of getting things done. Uh, I think I believe uh, in the in the near future we will be seeing organizational leaders coming. Uh, yeah, like I, I have this funding and I am kind of legitimately investing in our uh, relational infrastructure to get things done in a better, more systemic, more more uh, efficient way. And there is another uh, recent conversation uh, for the test past three, five years, uh, questioning the premise of design thinking and also kind of reflecting on uh, what is next. Uh, part of it is kind of a criticism, criticizing uh, in a way this this how design thinking was promoted in a, a linear as a, as a linear solutionist approach. And the main criticism is that how that kind of an approach. Uh, preserves the status quo of the designer and the key stakeholder that this kind of the design team uh, is engaged. And there's also some kind of a uh, reflection in this conversation as well. You know, what, what is even design thinking? What was we talking about? Is it something that this, this, this experts designers do like happens in their cognition? Is there some kind of cognitive ability of uh, expert designers? Or is it, is it just a marketing, uh, you know, hype that's been kind of uh, brought forward by you know consultancies or is it there's actually something to the design that is that is fit for the role fit for the task of uh, you know addressing complex uh, challenges and we, we believe we believe uh, there's a fit uh, for that for that for that kind of taking that that role but we it requires kind of a, a different way of uh, a radically different way of looking at uh, design and I think this radical way uh, starts with uh, how design moves beyond problem solving towards uh, being the solution itself. Uh, also, Bert and Emily was talking about this kind of objects in design and the designer's kind of obsession or uh, kind of overall emphasis, emphasis on the objects in the design process. And it's kind of, this brings us the uh, question, right? Like if you move a little bit away from this overemphasis on the design, uh, design objects or the or this kind of the solutions as as as, as things or just two dimensional things on the on the on the screens. Uh, it's actually this design capabilities and capacities that's unlocked throughout the process can be if it, if it can be the solution uh, in itself uh, to the uh, challenge that we are we are we are discussing basically. And some of the assumptions here as well. Uh, you can talk about approaching design as a way of working rather than a methodology. It creates uh, a space that enables designer to conversations to take place. So this space can be a, a true creative lab, a design lab in an organization. It can be a particular ritual meeting in an organization, or it can be a workshop. But like that space that enables creative exploration, uh, that space basically uh, enables learning and experimentation and collaboration to take place in the organization. And we see a great kind of a uh, deal of impact uh, of design thinking in the past 10 years when we look at uh, kind of design or design engagement as a, as a way of working. Uh, the second assumption is that if you can see design as a, as a, as a sense making uh, process uh, rather than problem solving, that where people in organizations co-create objects, not for the sake of co-creating objects, 
but for the more sake of the being encouraged to converge on collective meaning. Again, this kind of objects, not for the design object sense, but like all the objects serves to the uh, kind of the purpose of alignment or purpose of shared uh, meaning across the organizational uh, systems. And the third one, I think <laughs> this is a bit more provocative. Uh, can we give up the idea of definable design problem, uh, solution and project? And thus the result of design activity looks more like an ongoing uh, design process. So, right, like every, of course, we work with projects, right? It is a beginning uh, and an end. Uh, and, but how do we really treat these project, projects in a way that like every project is dynamically incomplete, it is temporarily uh, finish and this capacity is that capabilities that come out, come out of these processes what makes it uh, successful makes it, what makes us uh, scale and spread uh, in the systems that we try to influence and create impact for I think we can take a little pause here we have enough provocation and uh, kind of insights to actually define what relational uh, design is and this comes from again our from our personal context of practicing this so this is not a kind of coining the turf attempting to coin a, a term but like this is basically kind of cultivating what we've been discussing uh, for a while and uh, we can talk about relational design as the design process that prioritizes the outcomes of collective sense of trust, safety, ownership, belonging, shared meaning and purpose over the reductionist idea of, idea of design outputs as solutions. It is, it is definitely uh, more emergent rather than we try to control the kind of the solutions outputs, we rather create a space of emergence uh, for through relationships, through investing in relationships. And the success and the effectiveness, effectiveness of design process depends on the uh, quality of relationships. But what does it mean actually when it comes to the supply and demand of design and creative consultancy services? What does it really mean? So when we look at uh, how the uh, how the supply and demand of uh, kind of creative services, design services, consultancy services, right now it happens kind of at the end of uh, this spectrum, right? On the one end, this spectrum is, is the things, right? Like the design outputs, objects to dimensional solutions. These are the new concept deck, new product roadmap, new screens, new experience map, new service uh, blueprint. On the, on the other hand, we see it as the uh, organizations kind of purchasing, you can say, or supply or, or demanding, and the kind of the consultancies uh, supplying human capabilities. Uh, cultures and, and cap capacities. But this is happens in a quite siloed way, right? Like the, on the this things output spectrum, you can see more of a product department, marketing department, is this different, uh, that, that kind of budgets in organizations, or you can in on the other side of the spectrum at the human capability, which is more the organizational HR and the academy, uh, organizational academy is kind of investing in this kind of uh, in this kind of services. But when it comes to reality, we actually see things need practice and capabilities need context, right? Like if you want this new product roadmap, new, new kind of service concept to come to life and become successful, we actually need human capabilities, culture and capacities to bring them to life and then scale up, right? And for these human capabilities, culture, uh, and the capacities to be meaningful, they need a direction, they need a, they need a context, and they need the kind of that role of design objects uh, in the process to kind of uh, set that meaningful, purposeful uh, direction. So there is actually, a, like the way we deliver this service, there is actually a whole spectrum of that, that of missed opportunity for, for great impact, uh, basically, how we can actually tackle this uh, kind of this broad end spectrum together simultaneously and you know it might require maybe when uh, organizations are investing in these kind of services they, they demand uh, the spectrum uh, maybe different departments collaborating together different departmental budgets uh, collaborate together to invest uh, in these kind of services and also maybe even uh, purchasing departments also start understanding uh, or accepting what kind of services they are receiving uh, as part of this uh, spectrum, but there is again there is a, there is a whole domain of missed opportunity uh, here. There is a there is a there is a whole kind of a spectrum of what can be delivered, uh, and this is what we what we are calling community power transformation uh, through relational design, and we believe it's a kind of the domain of impactful creative and uh, consultancy uh, services. And this also means a great deal for design practices as well, right? When we start 
any project basically when we engage in any project any design project any creative project you can say you start with a purpose and it then scales through you know ones of people tens of people hundreds and uh, thousands and ten thousands of people uh, sometimes and it's it's basically all uh, kind of the it's same right it's people engaging with the process engaging with uh, objects and you can see you know learning programs kind of starts and scales to tens new spaces to hundreds uh, and then the kind of new services experiments to thousands and then brands and products to uh, ten thousands and what we kind of want to emphasize uh, here is that kind of this quality of the core quality defines the quality of the rest you know what that quality that happens around the purpose and the ones uh, and even tens uh, level it actually defines the quality of the what spreads what scales to the rest of this kind of uh, call centric uh, circles and uh, you know like you can think about the project uh, that that you are working on right now and how that project would be actually different if the kind of key four or five six people that working on it were intentionally investing in the relational quality uh, in that in that uh, process uh, that's kind of the uh, idea that one we wanted to convey uh, here and there is some uh, tips like how we kind of design, like practice relational uh, design. Uh, in maybe some some simple and quick tips, uh, identifying key relationships and intentionally working towards to elevate their quality of trust and safety in our projects. You know, uh, in your next project or tomorrow, thinking about your projects. Uh, this is how we can uh, start practicing relational design. Uh, working with disinter mediated sense, sense making, so it's in the design process, right? Like we do this research, we synthesize all this design, we bring insights to the system, uh, which generally in, in our practice we see that being not that effective. And how do we let people to make sense their own data? So interpretation of the data should rest with the people who are uh, using it. That can be a quick uh, way to uh, change how we practice relational design, and also. Uh, the third one is facilitate, facilitate, facilitate. We can double down on how we keep off things, beginnings, first interactions in projects, and engage it with care and curiosity and commitment. And this is the kind of last bit that I want to leave you with. Uh, this is a drawing from James Norbury, uh, his story of Big Panda and Tiny Dragon. Uh, it says, which is more important, asked Big Panda, the journey or the destination? The company, say Tiny Dragon. So when we think about, when we talk about solutions to these complex challenges in our situations, what if just, you know, um, humans just being together, showing up for each other, uh, learning to, uh, together, growing together, sometimes having fun, sometimes not having fun together, but really being there for each other, uh, slowing down, uh, you know, caring for each other is also referring to the <laughs> previous talk of Emily. Maybe it's just, a, yeah, just a solution. Uh, can we just see it as a solution uh, itself to the challenges that we face? So thank you very much. Any comments and questions to welcome? My uh, email is mart at atelier.io. Uh, thank you very much for being part of this conversation.